1 Thessalonians chapter 5, starting with verse 23. I want you to follow along in the text before you as we read. And the very God of peace sanctify you wholly. And I pray, God, your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Faithful is he that calleth you, who also will do it. Brethren, pray for us. Greet all the brethren with a holy kiss. I charge you by the Lord that this epistle be read unto all the holy brethren. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Amen. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Giving each believer the opportunity to confess all known sin before the Father and then ask that God might teach you. Let's pray. Father, we enjoy opening up the Word of God and to read it and to understand it because your Spirit takes the time to gently remind us of things that we have learned in the past and teach us things in this present and prepare us and prepare our learning and our thinking for those things that you are yet to give us. We give you thanks ahead of time and thank you, Father, for your grace and mercy extending to this hour that your Son, Jesus Christ, might be honored and glorified in all that we do and say, and that we might grow in the grace and knowledge of your Son. For it's in his wonderful name, the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Well, we've come to the point of the conclusion. Verses 23 to 28 concludes uh, Paul's letter. He's bringing it together, and he starts with the closing prayer. Paul is emphasizing a balance in Christian living. This is important. Um, he has the negative on one side and the positive on the other. If you look at that, the negative he has in verse uh, 22, abstain from all appearance of evil. Negative phrase. And then he gives the positive in this prayer. And the very God of peace sanctify you. Verse 23. Some churches only preach the negative. You shouldn't do this, you shouldn't do that, we don't do this, we don't do that. Whereas Paul gives not only that, but he also gives the positive of what we should do. The uh, being sanctified, being made holy by the Lord. Notice this, his closing prayer, verses 23 and verse 24. And the very God of peace sanctify you wholly. And I pray, God, your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Faithful is he that called you, who also will do it. If you notice that phrase right in, in the first part where he said, the very God of peace sanctify you wholly, and this phrase, I pray God. Do you notice that in your Bible? It's in italics. Do you know what italics means in your Bible? It's not found in the Greek text at all. It is implied within the Greek text. So the translators felt compelled to say, um, I pray God. Uh, it, it gives a, a clear feeling of, of what's being said there. Um, they probably would have done better if they would have said, may God, because that would go right with the uh, verbs and such that are being used in this text. They didn't, so you won't hear me say a whole lot more about that. Um, so, verse 23, And the very God of peace sanctify you wholly. To encourage the believers in Thessalonica, Paul put the spotlight on God's ability to produce peace. The church at Thessalonica, as individual people, had experienced God's peace through the preaching of the gospel of Jesus Christ. You've experienced that, that Christ has given you peace in areas of confusion, in areas of difficulty or unrest. He has given us peace through his very presence. So the very coming of the gospel was sufficient to bring peace. But he adds, and 
when he wrote this letter, that they were enjoying peace with one another. His prayer is that they would have peace with each other. And that God, who had given them peace, would be their adequate resource for future, as he had been in the past. Paul prayed that God would sanctify them in every area of, the life, of their lives. He uses the word hagiazo, to make holy, or to make separate. Paul isn't saying they could attain complete holiness this side of heaven. He isn't saying that sanctify you holy means that you're going to be perfect, that you will not be able to uh, sin. No, that really isn't possible this side of glory. But sanctify is best understood as being <coughs> set apart for God's exclusive use. God will have the ability to use you in ways you couldn't even imagine. He will set you apart. He will use you as a special tool in his own hand. There are three sanctifications that are given within Scripture. Uh, the first one is positional sanctification. Turn with me over to Hebrews chapter 10. It's just a few pages back in your book. Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 10. Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 10. By the which we are sanctified, separated, through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. We have a once for all been set apart for God by the shed blood of Jesus Christ. This happened when you received Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. When you received Christ as Lord and Savior, that which he did 2,000 years ago upon Calvary, he did for you. And that set you apart as unique. You're not like the rest of this old world. You've been set apart. That's a positional set apart. Set apart for him. Set apart with him. Then second, there's a practical sanctification in the scriptures found in 2 um, Corinthians, beautiful passage in 2 Corinthians chapter 7. 2 Corinthians chapter 7 and verse 1. Paul writes, Having therefore these promises, dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. This practical sanctification is a daily dealing with our sins and growth in holiness. When we sense sin within our life, when we identify that what we have done is apart from God's will, we confess that sin. What's the Bible promise us? If we confess our sins... He's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That was written to believers in Jesus Christ. John said that to believers, not to lost people. This isn't about your positional sanctification. He's talking about your practical sanctification. Moment by moment, you sense the sin, you confess the sin, he forgives it. And just as... Our, if you didn't confess the sin, would you still be his child? Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, I don't know what your relationship was to your father. My father was a very godly man, a Bible teacher, a wonderful man of God. And yet, when I would do something that was disobedient to him, and the two of us knew that something had been done in which I was in disobedience, the lines of communication seemed to break down. Like... There was no topic to talk about, really worth talking about, except that particular disobedience. And it, I needed to confess that as, as disobedience to my father and ask for his forgiveness. If I did not, was I his child? Yes, I was by birth. I would go to my grave as his child. If I changed my name, I would still be his child. Do you understand what I'm saying? We are God's children. 
And yet the sin seems to break down the communication, doesn't it? A free, open uh, talking with the Lord that we talked about last week. That open communication, discussion with him. And when we confess our sin, then that seems to open up again, just as it did um, between my, myself and my father when I confessed my sin. That's practical sanctification, moment by moment, daily, uh, day in, day out. And then third, there's the perfect sanctification. All of this, positional and practical, will culminate in perfect sanctification. 1 John 3, toward the end of your Bible, 1 John chapter 3, turn with me. 1 John chapter 3 and verse 2. John writes and says, Beloved, now we are the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be. But we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And every man that hath this hope in him purifieth himself, even as he is pure. When Christ returns, what a blessed day. A day that will be. Amen? Mm -hmm. Looking forward to that. When Jesus comes back, we will be like him. We will have perfect sanctification. We don't have it now. We will have it then, in which sin won't even come to mind, won't even come out in our, in our actions or in our words. Praise God. Perfect sanctification is awaiting for each believer when we see Christ and we become eternally like him. Expecting to see Jesus Christ is great motivation for holy living. He's coming soon. He also prayed that his readers would be preserved. Did you catch it? First, that he prayed that they would sanctify them, that God would sanctify them. And then second, that he would preserve them blameless. Let's look at that verse 23 again. The very God of peace sanctify you wholly and your whole spirit, soul, and body be preserved, blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus. Two parts in this, in this uh, beginning of the prayer. He's sanctified by God and preserved by God, blameless. That word preserved, uh, blameless, um, Word blameless is amemptos, which means no legitimate ground for accusation. There's nothing that can be brought up that would be brought against us. He wants us preserved in such a position that blame is not continuous against us. Um, and this is no uh, legitimate ground for accusation in view until the appearing parousia of the Lord Jesus Christ for his saints. When Christ comes, um, that's when that perfect sanctification will present itself. Until then, preserved, protected, uh, blameless. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 8. 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 8. First Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 8. Paul writes to Corinth and says, Who shall also confirm you until the end, that ye may be blameless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. <clears throat> blameless in that day. Preserved. Blameless. The very prospect of it is exciting. But what is being preserved, blameless, since there's still identifiable sin within my own life and in my own thinking patterns. What is being preserved? He says, body, soul, spirit is being preserved. Did you see that? Your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless until the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Christ. Paul spoke of the Christian as body, soul, and spirit. Now, I mentioned this a few weeks ago, and I just kind of touched on it. 
but I probably um, caused more confusion than I, <laughs> I did clarity, okay? Some walking away saying, well, what's, what's this and what, what's that? So let me give it to you in the way that Paul gives it to us, the spirit, the soul, and the body. You have a spirit, an eternal spirit, that's going to spend eternity someplace. You have a soul, a life principle, a breath. You have a body that it's placed in. And we likened uh, that week, the body being likened to a seed planted, and that the um, plant that comes from it, the roots and the plant that comes from it, completely um, eat up the seed, and the seed becomes nothing but dirt. It goes back to dirt, but something new, brand spanking new, is, is in its place. Let's look. The Spirit. The Spirit is the highest and the most unique part of man that separates man from plant and animal realm. It's eternal. Therefore, it enables man to be able to communicate with eternal beings, such as angels and God himself. Our ability to commune and to know of the existence of God is because God has given to us an eternal spirit. My cat, Jasmine, at home, does not have a spirit. She spends no time in prayer. She spends no time in communication. She is not going to spend eternity with me. Okay? That's the one that really upsets the ladies. <laughs> the idea that their doggy, their puppy isn't going, Fufu isn't going to follow them into glory with them. <laughs> the Fufu don't have a spirit. The Fufu has a soul, a breath, has a body, but has nothing that can communicate with um, a human, or a, an eternal being, such as a human or angel, or God. Um, this word that's given to us is to pneuma. Pneuma. Pneumatic. Okay? What, what you're tired. Gee, they don't use that word very much anymore, do they? Remember when they used to talk about pneumatic tires? Because you could have solid tires, solid rubber tires before ancient of days, okay? Uh, then they came out with this pneumatic tire. Whoa, what was the difference? It had something blown into it. It had wind blown into it that made it softer ride than the, than the other ones. To pneuma. In Greek, that word pneuma means breeze. It's the wind that you can feel on your face on a hot day. It is eternal spirit. This corresponds to the Hebrew word ruach, ruach in the Old Testament. That is the spirit. Uh, the spirit of God is referred to as the pneuma in the Greek in the New Testament. In the Old Testament, he's referred to as ruach, the, the breath, the spirit. The spirit is not found in any other earthly life form, such as a plant or an animal but it's present in angels. It's present in fallen angels. Fallen angels will spend eternity someplace, okay? That which has a pneuma, a spirit within them, will spend eternity. It's found in the living God, Ruach, the Spirit of God. One of the three parts of the Trinity is the Numa, the Ruach, the Spirit of God. And that's what we can communicate with right now. Spirit. Then he mentions soul. The soul is the part of man that makes him <coughs> conscious of himself. My cat knows that there's a cat in the house. Okay? Of course, I think she believes there's a queen in the house. There's one of royalty and you know, the Egyptians worshipped cats. Cats have never forgotten that. And they've kind of always considered that they were worthy of, of that. My cat has a consciousness of herself. 
She has a consciousness of me. But we cannot truly communicate in spirit because <coughs> she is not eternal. The soul within man is the seed of his personality. It's what makes you uniquely you. And it's a part of your thought. The word in the Greek is suche. Remember I said anytime one of these Greek words come into the English, what happens to the you? It usually turns into a Y. Psyche. Psychology. The study of the well, actually, it's the study of the soul. But to the Greek, the soul was found within its mind, in its mental capacity. Um, so psyche comes in here. Psyche in the Greek language means um, a breath. It's animal vitality. Um, you can tell when the psyche, when the mind, when that breath leaves an individual. I remember sitting next to my father in at uh, Boswell Hospital, excuse me, Thunderbird Hospital, and he was breathing, very shallow breathing, and then I glanced over, and he wasn't breathing. The breath left him. <clears throat> that word breath in the Hebrew language is nefesh, nefesh. This is the soul. This is the breath of an, of an individual. Um, as unique from the general life principle, um, in the Greek, there is a word for, for just life principle, and it's zoe. Zoology is the study of animals, right? Or life, as, as it might be. And that, in the Hebrew language, is chai. Chai. Um, just simply life. And this is used in reference to animals. It's used in reference to plants um, in, in both of those languages as well. Plant life, animal life, your breath, your, what makes you you, um, and you conscience of yourself. And then third is the body, the body. The body, of course, is the physical part through which the inner person expresses oneself, that your soul expresses itself in your body. It is your body that we immediately recognize. When you walked in here tonight, we could recognize you. You didn't have to say a word. And we recognized who you were by looking at your soma, looking at your body. Um, that physical characteristics make you recognizable to others. Tosoma in the Greek language is the physical body, the body of an organism, of a human body. And this soma, this body, is used whether the body is alive and breathing or whether it's dead. Whether the plant is thriving or whether it's brown and dead. <clears throat> They still utilize the word soma to describe the body in the Greek language. Um, so, oh, and we use this word as well. Uh, not only psychology here, but psychosomatic illness, okay? Mind influencing the body. You've actually, your thinking makes you sick and have physical signs of disease or wear because of a psychosomatic disease. Beloved, the English language is remarkable. You can actually use psychosomatic in reference to the body affecting the mind's um, uh, health as well. But it is rare. It, I just, you just never seem to come upon it. But the word is there because psychosomatic means the relationship between the mind, the soul, and the soma, the body, the physical part, the mind and the, and the physical. Uh, such as a physical disorders with mental or emotional causes. You've heard of psychosomatic. 
the Hebrew word for this body, they also, in the Old Testament, utilize the word nefesh. Because if it isn't alive to them, it really doesn't have much, much value. You know, if it's dead, you just you cover it up before it stinks. Um, so nefesh. But they have several different words in the Hebrew language for body, and it's used in different different manners. They have uh, the word nefesh, and that's only if the body is alive, they'll utilize the word nefesh. If the body is dead, they never utilize the word nefesh. If the body is dead, um, they'll use the word gefa. Uh, gefa. Um, Saul's gefa was nailed to the wall. His head was cut off, remember? And then the Philistines nailed his body, his torso, the physical part of him, to the wall. Gefa. Um, it's body, but it is usually just this part of the body. It does not talk about the appendages. They also have the word nebela. Nebela. And nebela is used for the body only when it's absolutely stone dead. We would utilize the word. In the, in the Hebrew, when you're reading along in your King James Bible, is say the body of so-and-so laying there. And so, we would normally use the word carcass. Okay? It's it's a definitely dead body, where nefesh is definitely a live body, okay? And geva, you really have to get a little more information. Uh, turn with me, Isaiah, let's, let's see these words in, in action. Uh, I'm not going to labor this. The purpose is not to teach Hebrew. Um, but Isaiah chapter 10 and verse 18. Isaiah chapter 10. To come up with these notes, I went through a lot of Hebrew scripture this past week. Um, this one was really choice. Um, Hebrews chapter, excuse me, Isaiah chapter 10 and verse 18. We read, And shall consume the glory of his forest and of his fruit field, both soul, nefesh, and body, basar. Um, of his, it says, and they shall be when a standard bearer faint, both <clears throat> soul and body. The life part, nefesh, remember that's live, that's the breath, and besar is limp, simply the body itself. Here's an interesting one. I, I just got to mention it because it's it was fun when I hit it um, in uh, Proverbs chapter five and verse ten. Proverbs, right after the book of Psalms, Proverbs chapter 5 and verse 10. Proverbs 5, 10, Solomon writes and says, Lest strangers be filled with thy wealth. Oops, I'm sorry. Uh-huh, 11. Uh, my 10 needed two ones in it instead of just one. Um, I'm sorry. Um, and thou shalt mourn at the last, verse 11, when thy flesh and thy body are consumed. Okay, what's the difference between your flesh and your body? I looked at that. It was marvelous. Flesh is the Hebrew word basar. The body, okay? And um, the, the second one, in verse, in verse 11 there, the body is the word she'er. 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 Which, um, how would we translate that? We would translate that not just flesh, but meat. 
or food. Okay, at this point, <laughs> there isn't much to do with the body. It's uh, crow's meat, right? It's being eaten by, by critters. She'er is meat or food. And yet, look at how our King James translates it with the word body. So, it was an interesting study, I have to say. But I would say, um, well, I'll, I'll show you as it comes into the New Testament. The body was made from dust, and the body is destined to return to dust. The body you're sitting in tonight will never make it to glory. <laughs> Thank goodness, some of you say, because this one is off warranty. It's just got too many parts not working uh, just the way they ought to. This body will has to be changed in a moment. In a twinkling of an eye, when the last trump sounds, this body will become like his incorruptible body, okay? We will be changed in a moment. This body is not the one that's going into glory. Um, as we talked about the, the seed being planted in the ground and that it puts on a root and it puts on a plant and that plant gives forth leaves and such. Um, showing the life. And then after a while, this just, this present earthly body is going to be nothing but dust. It came from dust. It is going to um, dust. It's returning to dust. Paul was saying then that he, had that he had desired that the Thessalonians would be kept blameless by God in their relationship with him, that's their spirit, in their interpersonal lives, their soul, and their social contact with other people, with their bodies. Elsewhere, man is described as having body and um, soul, or body and spirit. These two um, get mixed rather easily um, in, our, in our thinking and in some of the passages. Uh, 2 Corinthians, once again, I won't believe it, the 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 7, verse 1. You just need to see these. 2 Corinthians chapter 7 and verse 1. 2 Corinthians 7 and verse 1. Having therefore these promises, dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and the spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. The flesh is the Greek sarko, um, sarkos. Huh? Sarkos. Um, which would be closer to these words on the dead bodies. Um, just the lifeless, seemingly lifeless body. Having therefore these promises, dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the sarkos, the flesh, and the spirit, pneumatos, um, which is what we were looking at, that which can communicate with God. Perfecting holiness in the fear of God. Sanctification. This is the practical sanctification that he's talking about. Ah, did you notice that the verse I'm talking about, Sarkos here, is the very verse we talked about practical um, application of sanctification. Then James chapter 2 and verse 26. James 2.26, let me just read it. James 2.26, if you're quick, you can see it or just jot it down. James 2.26, For as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. <coughs> James is not talking us about there is only a body and a spirit within us. And some who believe to this by um, parte type thinking of the human body, of body and spirit, um, point to this passage 
What's James talking about in this passage? Well, when you look at the context and what he's saying here, he's talking about faith without works is dead. He's talking about faith. He ain't talking about your body, all right? He's just using as an example that when you're the breath, Numa, the breath, the ruach, because he was Jewish, when the ruach, when the breath leaves you, your body is dead. If faith is taken out of the works, it becomes a dead sort. And then I want you to turn to this one. This one's pretty important because understand, Matthew chapter 10 and verse 28 was not given, <laughs> was not given to the people there listening in Greek. It was given in Aramaic. Jesus was speaking this. And so look at this and let's see what, what he says. In Matthew chapter 10, Matthew chapter 10 and verse 28. Matthew chapter 10 and verse 28. And, I'm, and don't, don't turn away from this quickly, okay? I want, you to, I want us to think on this passage for just a few moments. Matthew chapter 10 and verse 28. Mm -hmm. And fear not them, says Jesus, which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul, but rather fear him which is able to destroy both the soul and the body in hell. This passage is given countless times by those that say, we don't have a spirit, soul, and body. Spirit and soul are the same thing. And therefore, we just have soul and, and body, or we have uh, spirit and body. Um, and they come to this passage of scripture. Let's look at what Jesus has to say here. Because he says, fear not them which kill, apotechnio, which means slay, okay? And if you write in your Bible, this would be the time. Fear not them which slay the body. And the Greek word there is soma, okay? But I looked it up in the modern Hebrew translation. And in Hebrew, it's geva, okay? Soma, geva. Um, to slay the geva, the soma, the body, but are not... They are unable to kill or slay the soul. And the Greek, the Greek word that's used there is psyche. <clears throat> and in the modern Hebrew text, it uses nefesh, obviously, it, it, which makes sense. So soul and body is what Jesus is talking about in this text. The soul, um, that which you recognize yourself, your uniqueness, your individuality, and your body, which other people recognize you by, by looking at it. They're able to kill this, the body. But they cannot touch you as an individual. Jesus is making a big point here, an important point. They cannot touch that. Rather, he says, fear him, you can point heavenward, which is able to, not the word slay or, or dig, are, are uh, kill. It's destroy. Apolumen, which is ruin or punish. Who is, but fear him, God, who is able to punish both the psyche, the soul, the nefesh, and the body, the soma, gave up in hell fire. Luke chapter 12 and verse 4, same. Same thing Jesus is saying there. And he adds the phrase, and after that, there's no more that they can do. That's it. They can kill a body, but they can't do anything more. Don't be afraid of them then. Why? Well, there's a whole lot more of you than that which is going to, going to turn into dirt anyway. Got it? This is not important. This is important. Your spirit, um, your individuality, your soul. Rather fear him. In Luke, he makes this particular solemn. He adds, I will forewarn you whom ye shall fear. 
says Jesus, even him, which is able to destroy both the soul and the body in hell. Um, James Fawcett Brown, on the, in their commentary, they wrote this, that this text, Matthew chapter 10, verse 28, they say, quote, a decisive proof that there is a hell for the body as well as for the soul in the eternal world. In other words, that the torment that awaits the lost will have elements of suffering adapted to the material as well as the mental part of our nature, both of which we are assured will exist forever, says Jameson, Fawcett, and Brown. But we're going to get a new body <laughs> for our spirit and soul. Okay, verse 24 finishes the prayer. Faithful is he that calleth you who also will do it. The same God who calls us will keep us by the Holy Spirit who indwells us. God is faithful to bring completion to the work he has begun in us believers. Philippians chapter 1 and verse 6, Be confident of these things, that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. God doesn't save a person by grace and then leave him alone to work out his Christian growth by his own works. Galatians 3, um, verse uh, 2 and following. This only would I learn of you. Receive ye the Spirit by the works of the law, or by the hearing of faith? Are ye so foolish? Having begun in the Spirit, are ye now made perfect, holy, by the flesh? As God calls justifies you and I by grace. He sanctifies by grace as well. And then second, request for prayer. Verse 25. Verse 25. Brethren, pray for us. Curious. Us. And when he says us, he's talking about Timothy and Silas and himself. Pray for us, those, these ministers. The same God who calls us will keep us by the Holy Spirit who indwells us. He's faithful. Curiously, unlike most of, of Paul's other epistles, this closing section doesn't tell us if it was written by him or an amunescence or a, a scribe. Since this is his first epistle, I had only assumed that he wrote it himself, that he didn't have any, any secretary to write this for him, that it's actually written in his own hand. He starts off by saying, brethren, or brothers. Paul didn't claim superiority over the Grecian believers, but recognized the equality of all the redeemed in sight of their heavenly father. Paul had come a long way from being that proud Pharisee who wouldn't even touch or associate with unclean Gentiles to the place where he could consider those Gentiles, believers in Christ, perfectly co-equal with himself before God. This is the first time in, in the letter that the greeting brothers occurs at the beginning of the sentence. <laughs> you say, so? Well, he uses this word brother 15 times in this one letter. We've seen that word brother again and again and again throughout, but it never starts the verse. It's almost uh, um, an emphatic because it's put in the front position. It's, you're my brothers. You're my brothers, so pray for us. Be, God is, uh, keep us in <clears throat> your prayers. Paul's appeal for prayer was to those he regarded as his own family, brothers. Doubtless, much of the success of his missionary work could be attributed to the prayer of the Thessalonians and other believers in Christ. Paul understood both his personal inefficient, uh, insufficiency and God's total sufficiency. He would later say in 2 Corinthians 3.5, 
not that we are sufficient of ourselves to think anything as of ourselves, but our sufficiency is of God. Therefore, he requests prayer for his fellow workers as well as for himself. Matthew Henry, in his commentary, says this, Ministers stand in need of their people's prayers. The more people pray for their ministers, the more good ministers may have from God and the more benefit people may receive by their ministry. Did you catch what he's saying? We pray for our pastor Shaw, and we pray for his preaching and teaching ministry. And as we pray for him, collectively pray for him, his abilities of understanding what the Spirit is saying and giving to us makes us the recipients of a great blessing, more than what would it come if we did not pray. Did you catch that? Mm -hmm. And that's what Paul's doing. Brothers, pray for us. This is an important part of your ministry as a believer in Jesus Christ. And then the final uh, salute in verse 26. <clears throat> Greet all the brethren with a holy kiss. It was common in Paul's culture, as many cultures today, to greet friends with a kiss on the cheek, or maybe even a kiss on both cheeks. The men greeted other men in this manner, and the women did the same with other women. Such a kiss communicated a personal respect and affection. It did not express romantic love. By urging this practice, Paul was encouraging an outward physical expression of true Christian love in a form that was culturally acceptable to his day. Um, I can't remember what book this comes from, but it's what this uh, quote is written by Al Wright Jr. And he says, the kiss is most often used of touching the lips with another person's lips, cheeks, or shoulders, hands, or as a gesture of friendship, acceptance, respect, and reverence. The location of the kiss carried different meanings, as Jesus made clear in the episode of the woman kissing his feet in Luke chapter 7, starting with verse 36. With the exception of three occurrences, Proverbs 7.13, the Song of Solomon 1.2, Song of Solomon um, 8 and verse 1, the term kiss is used with no romantic overtones. It's always between brethren. The kiss translates two Hebrew words and three Greek words. The basic Hebrew word is found 32 times. The basic Greek term is found seven times. In the Old Testament, close relatives kissed in greeting and departing with a connotation of acceptance. Uh, the term was further used as a gesture of reverence. Reverence even exists to, to idols. A kiss of betrayal is also found in the Old Testament. The term of kiss in the New Testament is used of Judas, of the father to the prodigal son as a sign of acceptance and reconciliation of the Ephesian elders to Paul as a sign of gratitude, the woman who kisses the feet of Jesus, and the holy kiss that we're talking about in this text. The holy kiss was widely practiced among early Christians as a matter of greeting, a sign of acceptance, an impartation of blessing. This custom could well have been used to express the unity in Christian fellowship. <laughs> Beloved, I got to thinking about this. When I first started in the ministry, most of my ministry was with Orthodox or conservative Jews. I went into synagogues and shared the gospel in synagogues and with Jews, making relationship on the streets in Borough Park, Brooklyn, sharing the gospel, handing out texts and stuff in, in uh, Hebrew and in, in, in English and in Yiddish, trying to open up communication there in New York um, with, with Jewish people. And so I have been in a lot of Jewish synagogues of a lot of different flavors. And do they greet one another with a kiss? No. 
they don't. When is kissing used among the Jewish people? It's among relatives expressing um, acceptance and, and familiarity in, in a family. It is also used in coming before a distinguished rabbi. They'll take the rabbi by the beard and they will kiss his beard, not him. That, that would be too far. They take his beard and they kiss his beard, which shows total respect for him. The kiss of Judas constantly is old cheeker, isn't it, on all the movies and such. I don't believe that at all. I believe he walked up, grabbed his beard to kiss his beard out of reverence, identifying him as the rabbi, because he would not have gone to Peter and kissed him. He would not have gone to James and kissed him. Judas would go to a rabbi and identify that rabbi to the soldiers so they can take him. And he grabs the beard. And there's some question whether he even gives the kiss to the beard. Jesus said, you would betray me with a kiss? It never really says he kissed him. He is, in the process, they are, the soldiers already have figured out and Peter is already pulling out his sword at this point in time, all right? So things get kind of um, exciting at that particular point. The kiss among Jewish people is to a rabbi to show honor, okay? But it wouldn't be among Jewish people in the synagogue. I have been in Greek Orthodox services, okay? And there's a whole lot of kissing going on in, the, in those services. Because in Eastern um, Europe, kissing is done between men and men and women and women. A man would never give a kiss to, the, to a woman unless it was in private and it was his wife or it was his child. But to another man, it's a, it's a common greeting. And it's usually to both cheeks. This practice, still... Um, parts of Eastern Europe, uh, among the churches, as you come into the church and such, brothers will grab you and, and kiss you on, on both cheeks. Um, I had to get used to that when I was in Romania and Moldova. The Romanians, this is how they greet one another in the church. They come up and, and the men kiss each other, and they don't kiss just once. They kiss on both cheeks and, and go on to the next one, all right? And I would be introduced, this is the American preacher, and the, the, and the deacon board would nail me. One, they'd stand in line. And I have been kissed by more Romanian men than American women. That is a fact, all right? This is a part of the custom. And this was the part of the custom in the Greek church there in Thessalonica. And Paul is reminding them a holy kiss, a kiss of holiness. Peter later on says a kiss of love, brother, and the, he uses the word brotherly love, a kiss showing the affection of one brother to another brother. Um, very important for us to understand what Paul is, is trying to express here. It's an acceptable alternative to our Western culture today, might be an embrace Americans will, you know, in, in many churches come up and they'll give each other a big old, a big old hug or, or one of those side shoulder hugs that, that will, will do. Uh, handshake, a uh, pat on the back. Uh, J.B. Phillips, in his paraphrasing for um, Americans, he says to this verse, give a handshake all around among the brethren. The living Bible phrase of this is shake hands for me with all the brethren there. But those are paraphrases. He says, a holy kiss. And they understood what needed to be done. And then, command for the public reading. This is really more serious than I can get into um, in the short time we've got. But verse 27 says, um, I charge you, by the Lord, that this epistle be read unto all the holy brethren. He cuts 
from the us, we terminology that he's used throughout the book. And he cuts to I. I charge you. A better translation of that is I adjure you. I command you. I call you under oath before the Lord God. It's really, a, I'm not joking. In the Greek, this is one of those phrases that you double take and read again saying, oh, I surely didn't read that right. I double took it because this particular word that is used here, the <clears throat> anorkizo, he must, um, is used nowhere else in the Bible. Nowhere. Because nowhere else in the Bible are we getting direct commands. Someone telling us that you do it, and I'm telling you, you do it by the Lord God, you do this. Um, that kind of terminology uh, we don't use very much. This final exhortation strongly urges that his letter be read to all the brothers. Probably the whole Thessalonian church is what he had in mind. The normal usage of the Greek is for um, that word read implies read it out loud, read it audibly, that everyone can hear it. Paul's words, I don't know how to express it, are surprisingly strong here. He puts his readers under an oath. I charge you, says the King James, to do this, suggesting that God would bring discipline upon them if they neglected this charge. There were some problems in the church that Paul wanted to get by having everyone hear his words. Or maybe he just realized that this epistle was written under divine inspiration, that he was writing as fast as he could because the Lord was speaking through him. Maybe it's both. <laughs> he recognized the importance of it and he recognized it, its divine origin. The word of God is an important thing in the local church. The word of God must govern our conduct and guide our lives. You and I are to read the word personally, but we also need to hear the word of God in the fellowship of the local church, for the one experience helps balance the other. Listen to me. We're doing that. Anytime you're in a Bible uh, class that I'm teaching, I will read that entire book to you twice, audibly, at minimum, twice, oftentimes various pas passages more than twice. I always open with the public reading of the text we're going to look at. I read through it as we go through it, piece by piece, verse by verse, because the public reading of Scripture, I believe, is primary. And I believe it's primary in the worship service. When I think back upon the years that I served as a pastor, I kick myself again and again. I wished I would have put more of the worship time into the public reading of God's holy word. Because as I went from house to house sharing with people, I realized a lot of Christians aren't reading God's word. They don't spend their time in the scripture as you do. And so the public reading of scripture is primary. And when lost people come into our services, it's primary that they hear God's word being read audibly. Just tell me the value of the announcements as opposed to the reading of God's word. I command you. Read it audibly is Paul's word on this subject. And then finally we'll close. Benediction, verse 28. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. And then our King James adds the word, Amen. Paul referred by God's grace in each of this, his uh, letters, his benediction. The grace of God was Paul's great delight. He identified it as the grace that comes through our Lord Jesus Christ. In him, Jesus, Christians have all. Obviously, the grace of God is always with his children. Yes, but God's, 
But Paul's concern was that his readers experience and enjoy God's grace. All that one has in Christ is due solely to God's grace. Amen? Amen. And the amen is not in the Greek text, but was added by our English translators, and I don't fault them for what was being said prior demands an amen. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for your word. Thank you, Father, that you have given us your word that we might grow in the understanding of your son, Jesus Christ, and that we might behave more like him and give you the honor and praise. Thank you, Father, for these guys, how precious they are to my heart. I pray your blessing upon each and every one here represented and the families so represented. Strengthen and guide that your name might be honored in Jesus' name. Amen. Mm-hmm.